Hi, my name is Helge Maus from Pixel Train. Nice to have you back in this third lesson about point movements, plexus effect and trails inside of Houdini. In this lesson, we want to talk about different methods of generating trails inside of Houdini. Like before, we don't want to look only in one technique which generates the trails. We want to learn a little bit about Houdini and how it thinks. And so I want to show you some approaches of making trails. We will start here in this scene, which we built in the last two lessons. In the first lesson, we made a point generator. So first we scattered points here, you remember. And these points will be scattered with a scatter node, but we built a switch here so we can scatter from a surface. Also, we can scatter from a volume. And then we build some kinds of point movement generators. And we had this WAP here, which we built together as an asset, as a movement generator. And in the last lesson, then we made a plexus effect by connecting these pieces together here. And then we had some nodes, for example, the wire, the pulley wire, and the add node to make this randable plexus effect. In this lesson now, like I've said, we want to do trails. We go to the left part. We had here our spring node. The spring node is like a simulation of point or particle movements without having a whole pop network. And we animated these points by only adding some forces. Here is a turbulence inside this node and we have some moving points. So this is a good starting point for our trails here. So the first node we want to look at is the trail node. And like the name says, it follows positions over time in space and generates trails of that. If we go here now and look at the result types, you see we have four different result types we can get. And often use of the trail node is the compute velocity. So if you need a velocity vector for moving objects and you have to calculate it by yourself, you can use the trail node for this. So a really often used scenario. But in our case, we want to generate a polygon shape. So we select here the polygon. And then we have here some options we have to set. The first option we want to look at is the cache size. The trail node caches it in RAM, and so you can decide how big the cache size in frames is. Keep in mind that sometimes this cache is not really accurate. So if you jump around in your timeline and you haven't finished your cache and so on, your cache gets dirty. And so if you really want to make sure that your cache is really now cleaned up and you want to start again, uh, use the reset cache if you place here your time indicator press reset cache if you have done something before. Then we have the trail length we want to produce. In our case, for example, 60 frames. And then we get points. And these points are now in every frame. Let us take a look. It takes a while and then suddenly we start to get these nice, cool looking trails here. These are, like I've said, polygons. And because the polygons are not closed completely in the moment, they look like these nice arrows here. And if I make the points with this display point option visible, you see that's the reason why we see this trail so late. Because, yeah, they have to be curved until we see now this polygon here. But you see also that in every frame, the position of our moving point is now sampled. And if you want to have some fewer points, you can change the trail increment here. If you use a spring node here, keep in mind that you need full frames here. You can't use a half frame here, but I show you, for example, this example, we go to trail increment of three. I go back, I reset the cache really to make sure that nothing is in the RAM. And if you now press here, play, you see the gaps are bigger between these trails here and you get a little bit less points. And yeah, it looks cool, but it's not exactly what we want to have. But I think it's a nice effect here. 
And if you want to use this later, you can use a file cache node here to cache the result out somewhere in your project here. And then you can load this here from disk. So it's fast and reliable and you can walk around here. Or you use the time shift node then to search for a frame which you like for this nice effect. So this is one use of the trail node. You can also try here, for example, connect a smash. You see this really funny looking shape here because the points are now connected here and the connectivity is something you can here change. So you can decide how the connections are made. And if you take your columns, you really see now trails because, yeah, let us wait here. My viewport goes a little bit crazy here. And then you see the connections between these points here. The rows are closed. This is something we don't want that the shape is closed so that we have open rows here. And I go back, reset my cache again and really cache this true. These are really nice trails with a length here of 60 frames. This is also a nice effect we can use for our trails. This is the first approach, the trail node, but we have another approach inside of Houdini. This next approach I want to show you is we build our own trail solver. Let us add a solver node. And the solver node here has a nice icon. It's a little brain here. It delivers us our own context to build a solver. So the first question is, what is a solver? Let us dive into a solver. You see here inside of the solver, we have these four inputs we have on the solver node. So we can use them later for a different kind of purposes. And normally we deliver our data here through the first input. And this is this input number one. But a solver looks into the past. And this is shown here by the previous frame. That means we can see the last result and here we can calculate a new result and we can connect these two together. And this is the job of a solver. That's the reason why we have to solve something always from the start to the end, step by step, and we can't jump around because we always have to see, okay, in the moment I'm here, now I change something and I get a new position, for example. And in the next frame, I can look back to this frame and connect it with the next motion. And we want to use this technique here to trace our point positions in time like we have done in the trail node. So on this input here, we get all the points which are there in the moment. And we can store this in a connection with the old frame. Sounds weird? Let us test this. You take a simple merge node and you connect now the old information with the new one. And important is that the output of this here has to be our merge. So to make it tidy, we say here we want to have a null and we say that this is our out here. I make outs normally black. So yeah, this is the out. Let us test this. I play back. And now I press do it. And if we go now out here and set our display flag to this here, you now see that we really get trails. But these are not polygon trails. If you take an extremely close look, you see that you now see all the points through the complete time. If I go back and I only step here, for example, one frame, you see here that this point here is connected to his old position. And so you get copies of the points through time. Cool. So you have built your own trail node with this. 
And now we have a problem <laughs> because if you now connect all these points, yeah, it looks like trails, it's cool, we can cache this, but they are still points. So what we want to have are edges. And if we now want to connect these points, we use a node which we had used before in this tutorial series. It's the add node. But if you now go here to add polygons and you do that, you remember that you get a connection between all the points here, which doesn't make sense for our case. We only want to connect points which are on the same path, better to say, which are the same particle through time. And to address them, we have to find them. If we now take a closer look to the geometry spreadsheet and I go back to frame number one, we see here, if we are on the point attributes, these are the points in our first frame. We have 2,000 points here. If we go now a little bit farther in time, we suddenly see we have doubled the amount of points here. You see, now we are at 4,000 and 5,000. We always get 1,000 points more. So how to find out which point belongs to which point? So we need something. And we have no attribute in the moment here where we can decide which point is the history of another point. And to do that, we can add an attribute to this stream. We have to go here before the solver, because here we have the original points. And we create our own attribute. So we take attribute create and add this here. And to create now an attribute, we have to tell a name. You see, if we only add this attribute create, we have an attribute with the name attribute one, and here it is. And what we need is something like a name. I name it ID. And as a data type for the ID, I tell it it can be a number, a full number, it's an integer. And now every point has the name of zero. That's not correct. Every point needs its own number. To get this number, we can use a local variable. Houdini has local variables for positions, for example, and color and so on. We have used some of them. And one variable which is very useful in this case is $PT. PT stands for the point number. We generated here with our scatter node a amount of points, in our case 1000 points, and every point has its number. And we number now all these points with this ID attribute. And this number flows now into the solver and every copy of the same point has the same ID. That's the whole trick. So if we now press play, we have now a full amount of points. Yeah, more and more points here. But we can identify every point here by its number. That's the whole idea behind this. You see here, if we now scroll through, we have here, for example, 2,000 points or much more here, 30,000. But the ID statement is always there and you only have to search here for the same ID. And this ID is something we can now use in the add node. We go into the add node. We want to generate polygons by group, but not by a group name. We want to generate them by an attribute we give it. And the attribute is our ID. You have to write the name which you have given here into this here. And if we now take a look here to the add node, we now see that we really get trails. Now these points are really connected by a edge. And now we can use the same ideas we had before in the plexus effect to mesh them out if we like. So you see these big strips here. We take an attribute create here. 
and we set the width down on the points to something really low and we get here our nice trails. So that's it for this lesson about trail generation. I know there's much more we can do now with the attributes to make the trails vanish and so on, but I think it's enough for this lesson here. If you have questions, drop me a mail. My name is Helge Maus from Pixel Train. See you again in the next lessons.